Dr. Len Horowitz said in a speech before the Citizens Against Legal Loopholes rally, at the Capitol Mall 1996. I investigated the Department of Defense's germ warfare appropriations request, and learned that the option to develop synthetic biological agents, bioweapons as alternatives to nuclear weapons, came from Dr. Henry Kissinger, who was gradually placed in his position of authority as National Security Advisor under Richard Nixon, the most powerful man in government, by Nelson Rockefeller and his affiliates at the Council on Foreign Relations. Moreover, I traced where the money went. It went, in fact, to a firm called Lytton Bionetics, a subsidiary of the mega-military contractor Lytton Industries, whose president, Roy Ash, was being considered as an alternate to Henry Kissinger, for the National Security Advisor post. Instead, Roy Ash became Richard Nixon's chairman of the President's Advisory Council on Executive Organizations, and assistant to the President of the United States and Lytton Industries, was given over $5 billion in military contracts, during the first term of the Nixon administration, $10 million of which went towards the development of AIDS-like viruses. During his speech at the Capitol Mall and in his book, Emerging Viruses, AIDS and Ebola, Harvard graduate, Dr. Len Horowitz exposed, how Henry Kissinger, the Rockefellers, and other NWO minions, funded and created AIDS, Ebola, and other viruses as bioweapons to suit their depopulation agenda. Dr. Len Horowitz also said, you will learn, that Dr. Robert Gallo, the famous NCI molecular biologist, pardoned by President Clinton last year for scientific fraud and misconduct, and credited with the discovery of the AIDS virus, set about to develop immune system ravaging, AIDS-like viruses, along with other Lytton Bionetics researchers. You will learn, that they took monkey viruses that were humanly benign, recombined them with DNA, RNA, and enzymes from other animal viruses that caused leukemias, lymphomas, and sarcomas, and then to get them to jump species, they cultured these new mutant viruses in human white blood cells in some studies, and human fetal tissue cells in other studies, to produce immune system destroying, cancer causing viruses, that could enter humans, and produce virtually identical effects, to what the AIDS virus is currently doing in people around the world. In the end, the research question I asked, did these viruses, AIDS and Ebola, evolve naturally, were they accidentally produced, or were they intentionally created and deployed? I conclude, unquestionably, they are not natural. I leave you the reader, and concerned citizens of America and the world, to decide whether it was a horrible accident or treacherous covert population control experiment. I suddenly realized how easy it was, to access information I assumed would be classified. I selected and then output the information to the printer. The hard copy included Soviet, Caribbean, and Cuban international affairs references. Belitsky on how, where AIDS virus originated, read one title. It documented a Moscow World Service broadcast in English. Another, commentary accuses US of developing AIDS virus, was broadcast by the Havana International Service. A third in the Caribbean press, was tagged, German claims AIDS created by Pentagon. Moments later, the BPL librarian, returned with the Rockefeller Commission report about the CIA. Before he left, I asked, how I might locate the documents I had just learned about. He told me, they were on microfilm two floors up. Within a couple of hours, I had retrieved and read them all. Apparently, several researchers throughout the world, Dr. John Seal from London, Dr. Manuel Servin in Mexico, and Dr. Jacobo Siegel from Berlin, had alleged what Strecker had. The Russian report even cited a West German company, named Otrag, for having conducted green monkey virus experiments in Zaire, that had allegedly led to the development of a mutant virus that would be a human killer. Dr. Robert Strecker, was one of the first to publish peer-reviewed work, regarding the origin of the AIDS virus. He found, 
that there are no genetic markers in the AIDS virus typical of the primate, and that it simply cannot thrive in monkeys. He found that AIDS was non-existent in Africa before 1975, and yet supposedly resulted from a 1940s monkey bite. Even if it had, he showed how the resulting epidemic would have occurred in the 1960s, not the late 70s. Also if green monkeys were responsible for AIDS, the pygmies of rural Africa, should have many more AIDS cases than the urban populations, but the opposite is true. Strecker filed a Freedom of Information Act, request to obtain documents, showing that the U.S. Department of Defense appropriated $10 million in 1969, to studying immune system destroying agents, to be used for germ warfare. It was just shortly after this, that the World Health Organization began experimenting with a lymphotrophic virus, produced in cows, to use on humans. They found, as Strecker did, that AIDS thrives in cows, and cow carcasses and bovine lymphotrophic virus, BLV, is very similar to HIV. Dr. Len Horowitz also said, literature provided by the Strecker group surged readers to, please wake up. In 1969, United States Defense Department requested, and got $10 million to make the AIDS virus in labs, as a political and ethnic weapon, to be used mainly against blacks. The feasibility program and labs, were to have been completed by 1974 to 1975, the virus between 1974 to 1979. The World Health Organization started to inject AIDS-laced smallpox vaccine into over 100 million Africans in 1977. And over 2,000 young white male homosexuals in 1978, with a hepatitis B vaccine through the Centers for Disease Control, New York Blood Center. Colin, in his review, added, Strecker remarks, that it would be relatively easy to implant such viruses in the cow carcasses used to produce the smallpox vaccine. When the smallpox vaccine sera were recovered from the animal carcasses, animal lymphotrophic viruses could be carried or mutated or incorporated in the vaccine. The epidemiology of multiple contaminated smallpox vaccines given in the early 1970s would provide exactly the right timetable for such a widespread AIDS epidemic in Africa today. The original story propagated by the mass media was that AIDS was introduced to the human population by African green monkeys. Supposedly an African was bitten or had sex with a monkey, then brought it into the U.S. gay population. In an interview with Robert Strecker, Len Horowitz asked, but what about the green monkey theory, the theory that a green monkey bit an African or someone had sex with an ape? To which Dr. Strecker replied, that's just nonsense. Green monkeys are about the size of chickens. So the idea of a human having sex with a female monkey the size of a chicken is, of course, absurd. In addition, the theory that a transmission occurred through biting, of course, is always said to be close to impossible. If you look at the CDC and everybody else, they say that biting is not an easy way to spread these diseases, except in the case of the purported green monkey, which is suddenly the way it was spread. In 1977, WHO launched a major smallpox vaccine campaign in Africa, which began the rapid spread of AIDS there. Then in 1978 the Center for Disease Control, targeted 2,000 gay men, ones who specifically had multiple sexual partners, and gave them laced hepatitis B vaccines. The shots, manufactured by Merck, were administered in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Houston, and Chicago, the same six U.S. cities, with the highest incidence rates and death rates from AIDS. Continuing with Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Strecker's interview, they shed some light on the motive behind this scam. Strecker posits that the reason for intentionally infecting gays was, because little would be done about it, if you look in the world, what percentage of the world's AIDS cases are heterosexuals? Over 90%, it's only in this country that you have this strange, unexplained predominance of homosexuals, 
Just think about this. Suppose you put this virus in the heterosexuals or kids. What kind of response would have occurred, compared to the response that did occur? It has been repeatedly shown that, 1. HIV does not even lead to AIDS, 2. AIDS is actually a forced amalgamation of 30 different immune ailments into one misnomer, and 3. The drug, AZT administered to HIV AIDS patients, actually further suppresses the immune system. John Rappaport said, in the case of AIDS, I showed that HIV was never proved to cause anything. I also showed that AIDS was not one thing. AIDS was in truth a variety of states of immune suppression brought about, in different groups and, ultimately, different individuals by a large number of different causes. In this research, you are about to read, which took place between 1986 and 1988, I also realized, that AIDS was a perfect cover story for a covert targeting of populations, from gay men in NYC, to Africans in Uganda. Because, if you labeled them with AIDS, already a kind of hypnotic death sentence, and then, you treated them with highly toxic drugs like AZT, and you also, in effect, concealed what was really making them sick, you had depopulation on the march. A colleague of Robert Gallo, the AIDS discoverer, molecular biologist, Peter Duesberg, has a very different perspective from his associates. In Spin magazine January 1988, Duesberg told reporter Celia Farber that, scientists researching AIDS, are much less inclined to ask scrutinizing questions about the etiology of AIDS, when they have invested huge sums of money in companies, that make money on the hypothesis that HIV is the AIDS virus. William Hasseltine and Max Essex, for example, who are two of the top five AIDS researchers in the country, have millions in stocks in a company they founded, that has developed and will sell AIDS kits that test for HIV. How could they be objective? Gallo stands to make a lot of money from patent rights on the virus. His entire reputation depends on this virus. If HIV is not the cause of AIDS, there's nothing left for Gallo. In an interview with author John Rappaport, Peter Duesberg continued describing the facts of life in medical research, you have to be at NIH to see how they think. They're very very concerned with the next research step. The step that comes after what they've just discovered. You could remind them, that the kind of virus they're studying, HIV, just doesn't really qualify to cause a disease like AIDS and they would understand what you were saying, and they might even agree with you, as far as general principles were concerned. But then they'd turn around, and go right back to working on what they were doing before they talked to you. It's very hard to talk to a person who has a contract with a drug company in his pocket. How do you know that he's telling you the truth? Times have changed. This is high stakes science, financially. John Rappaport also said, I continued to find chemicals that could produce AIDS symptoms. But I also came across other factors which could cause these symptoms. Like chemicals, they had nothing to do with the fabled HIV virus. The most important one, was starvation, long-term chronic malnutrition. It can occur on one level among junkies, it can occur on an entirely different scale among people of the third world. Malnutrition is recognized as the single largest source of immune suppression in the world. The current definitions of AIDS in the third world now accept, by and large, three symptoms as central to AIDS, weight loss of 10% or more, wasting away, chronic diarrhea, and chronic fever. These are also signs of chronic malnutrition. Diarrhea, through bringing on severe dehydration is traditionally one of three largest killers in the world. This is nothing new. The reason these three symptoms are being used as frontline indicators of AIDS, involves widespread lack of lab testing facilities in third world countries. Doctors are meant to use these indicators to do fast, on the spot diagnoses of AIDS. In such a situation, numbers of AIDS cases will skyrocket and a hidden equality will be established between AIDS and hunger. 
but the disease is hunger, not AIDS. Millions upon millions of Africans have been and continue being misdiagnosed and given AZT when they need food. On top of this, most of the hunger and poverty in Africa today, was stirred up and created by Western nations. Hunger and poverty are not natural states of being, even for so-called third world nations. In fact, when first world charity organizations help poorer countries with food and medication, the long-term result always hurts the populations, and helps Western corporate pharmacratic imperialism. Even food donations have eventual damaging effects. Farmers and others essential to local economies, find it easier to stand in lines getting free food handed to them than it is to work the land. That is until the donations stop coming in or move to a different location, by that time, the villagers are dependent on their regular food deliveries. Local power structures change to reflect this, and food or food distribution, is used as a weapon by Western power brokers. John Rappaport, on his book, AIDS Incorporated Scandal of the Century, said, The truth is, AIDS is not a single illness, it is an international operation, a business, a bureaucracy. It is, in the third world, a way of substituting harmful medical drugs for what is needed, food. With AIDS, an attempt is being made to reduce varieties of suffering and political conflict and starvation and chemical abuse to a single entity. Since that viral entity, HIV, is sensational and frightening, it satisfies the desire not to think, not to learn, not to find out what is happening in a world of troubles. It is also easier to dump corrosive medical drugs, and pesticides on the third world, than to face up to their widening toxic effect on people. Easier to call their symptoms, AIDS. What happens when you try to paint a portrait of an area said to have AIDS, and you find, instead, a combination of drugs, pesticides, starvation, older diseases, and other environmental factors, all capable of causing immunosuppression? all capable of producing the symptoms of what is called AIDS. What happens is, if you want to satisfy your medical peers, if you want to win research grant monies, you overlook the anomalies and say it's all AIDS. If you don't, you admit the picture is diverse and confused. You face facts. You lose grants. AZT, the HIV AIDS medication, was approved by the FDA in record time granted a treatment or recommendation in less than five days, and full pharmaceutical licensing in less than six months. AZT specifically damages bone marrow, the site where raw materials for immune cells are manufactured. Thus they are prescribing an immune suppressant, to treat immune system problems. Essentially, if you didn't have AIDS before taking AZT, you're going to have it shortly thereafter. In his interview with John Rappaport, Peter Duesberg said, AZT is hell for the bone marrow. It kills normal cells quite, quite extensively, AZT is a poison. It is cytotoxic. I think that giving it to people with AIDS is highly irresponsible, the drug is only going to hurt you, and now they are giving it to people with no symptoms. It's supposed to prevent HIV from replicating, yet they can find no evidence that HIV is replicating in the first place. Carey Mullis, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his invention of the PCR process, that amplifies gene fragments has come to Duisburg's defense. Mullis insists that there is not one paper in the literature, that proves HIV causes AIDS. He derides those researchers who unthinkingly accept the HIV hypothesis another Nobel winner, Wally Gilbert who teaches at Harvard, has spoken in more muted tones about problems with the HIV hypothesis, as has Harry Rubin, a godfather of modern viral research, who teaches at Uck Berkeley along with Duesberg. Richard Stroman, a cell biologist at Berkeley, has voiced objections to the HIV model as well. There are many obvious objections, on scientific grounds, to HIV as the cause of AIDS. The traditional method of assigning a germ as the cause of a disease, called Koch's postulates, has failed to make anything of HIV. Many people diagnosed with AIDS, 
do not show HIV present in their bodies. No one can find a convincing description, after 17 years, of how HIV destroys immune cells. And so on. Yet the press continues to parrot the party line, and governments all over the world support HIV as the cause of AIDS with billions of dollars.